everyone. First of all, um, I'd like to um, acknowledge and uh, celebrate the first Australians on whose land the Australian National University operates and pay our respects um, to the elders of the Namri and Nanawal people past, present and emergent. So my name is um, Shoei Singh. I'm a postdoc fellow uh, at the ANU Malaysia Institute and the School of Cultural History and Language. Thank you um, to each and every one of you uh, for being here with us today, um, either in person or online. Uh, it is a, a new normal now that we kind of meet in this so-called hybrid uh, way. So even though um, technical wise is uh, quite uh, challenging to manage, but I do hope, and I do hope that it worked well today, but I really appreciate um, the opportunity to be able to um, gather on campus uh, again in, in Canberra. So for that, I think I, I really like to thank our keynote speaker, Professor Ian Ang, for um, agreeing to come from Sydney um, to deliver her keynote speech here in Canberra in person. And I also thank um, the ANU Australian Centre on China in the World, the Centre for the Study of the Chinese Southern Diaspora, and the School of Culture, History and Language for supporting this conference. So I now like to invite our director of the Australian Centre on China in the World, Professor Jane Gurley, to say a few words. Thank you and welcome everyone to the CIW Auditorium. For those who are here in person, it's wonderful to see not as many people as we'd like to have in normal circumstances, but considering the time for in uh, a, a lovely crowd here today. And welcome to all of you as well who are tuning in. I do hope the technology works well for you. Uh, I didn't want to take up too much time today except to say how wonderful it is to support uh, financially and through providing a location as well. Dr. Ying Xin's shows uh, Chinese diaspora forum that she has done a wonderful job of organising. The program looks absolutely fantastic. Uh, I would stress why you hear the Chinese, the Australian name of our centre, the Australian Centre on China in the world. Many people do assume that it is focused only on and primarily on the mainland. But of course, the mainland is big and very heavily populated and a lot of the scholars here at the ANU do focus on mainland developments. But our Chinese name for the centre uses Zhonghua quite particularly to stress that the centre is engaged not only in mainland China, but also Taiwan and the Chinese diaspora and the Chinese speaking world even more broadly than that. Uh, I think very difficult, also very interesting times to be a part of that Chinese diaspora and to be engaged in any kind of research on the topic. It's hugely important for us. And again, I'm absolutely delighted that CIW is able to support this event today. So I hope you have a wonderful and productive three days that the technology holds up and that those of you who are here visiting Canberra, possibly for the first time out of your own places uh, in over a year, that you'll get to enjoy the beautiful sunshine and our lovely campus as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Jane Goli. And I now invite uh, the co-director of, the, uh, of um, the Center for the Study of Chinese South and Diaspora at the ANU, uh, Dr. Jane Ferguson, to give a brief introduction to the center. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. So notice the requirement for this position is to be named Jane. Um, the Center for the Study of the Chinese Southern Diaspora was established in honor of Jennifer Cushman a former member of the Department of Far Eastern History at RSS, Research School of Pacific and Asian Studies. In 1975, she completed her PhD thesis at Cornell University entitled Fields from the Sea, Chinese Junk Trade with Siam during the late 18th and early 19th century. From Ithaca, she moved to Canberra where she spent the next decade as a popular teacher, scholar, and friend. During her years at the ANU, she organized a conference which resulted in the book she co-edited edited with Wang Gongwu, Changing Identities of the Southeast Asian Chinese Since World War II. No doubt some of you here will have read this book, but it's nice to mention. Anyhow, sadly, she passed away at the young age of 44 in 1989. So the center, um, the boost to establish the center, the Cushman Memorial Fund, were twofold. A bequest of Jennifer, Ben Besson, a scholar of Thailand, 
and the Jian Qingguo Foundation of Taiwan. The center's charter is to promote the research on the people of Chinese descent or cultural connections in Southeast Asia and the South Pacific, but does not take an exclusive, singular, or disciplinary stance. It is through this disciplinary work that we can not only consider Chinese diasporic studies in Southeast Asia, but also question how discourses about Chineseness operate across different fields of inquiry and study. Furthermore, the advantage of a regional conceptualization actively issues the scope of a single nation state and offers a chance for scholars of different backgrounds and interests to engage and debate their questions and findings together. Therefore, it is an honor and a privilege to be able to offer thanks to Ying Xin Cho for the tremendous job that she has done in putting this event together in spite of everything. And welcome everyone to the ANU for this workshop. I very much look forward to learning from your presentations and discussions over the next few days. Thank you. Thank you, James. And um, as the convener of the conference, I would just like to briefly introduce um, the background of this conference. Um, I uh, promise it won't be long. So um, diaspora is a very much um, contested word as well as the word uh, Chinese. So by connecting them together, we hope to really stress precisely the ambiguities and um, the plurality that um, the two words bring and kind of reinvest new energies to look at the diverse community um, from a South perspective. And for decades, the study of Chinese diaspora or overseas Chinese have been of interest of scholars all around the world, and the ANU had played an important role in it. So um, these studies, however, are complicated further by this particular uh, transformation of uh, mainland China um, during the last 30 years or so. And with um, the PRC uh, attempting to kind of recruit all individuals and communities of the Chinese descent to the China tree, um, both the Chinese diaspora as a group of people and the field of Chinese diaspora studies are facing a critical moment. So I think um, this conference, we, um, we aim to kind of offer a platform for a critical assessment of the study of diaspora Chinese, especially in light of the unsettling um, developments that we are currently witnessing right now. So without um, further ado, I'd like to invite our moderator of the keynote session, Professor Anthony Reed, um, Emeritus Professor of Southeast Asian History at the ANU, to introduce our distinguished keynote speaker today. Professor Reed. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, And like the previous speakers, I want to rejoice and Thanking Chin, but above all, thank the college and and uh, the school for making it possible to have somebody young in the, the business of Southeast Asian studies. I mean, I think of Jane is impossibly young already, but uh, I'm sure uh, you will have noticed that, that since that generation, nobody else has survived. I mean, they, they seem not to quite notice that in assassinating the older people, it didn't matter so much. They casually made things impossible for a new generation to arise. And so it's wonderful to have Ying Shen here and doing things and uh, thinking new thoughts and doing all the, the good things that the young have to do to keep us all ticking over. Um, well, uh, you know, needs a little introduction to this audience, I'm sure. Uh, since moving to Sydney in the 1990s, she's um, been a star in the, in the government of diaspora studies in this country. Um, and around the world. Um, our own paths crossed at the end of the 1990s uh, when this centre was in the process of trying to get organised. Uh, I was trying to give birth to it and uh, at a time when the Chinese diaspora was, was flying high, everybody was talking about it, it was prospering, uh, where the PRC was floundering a bit um, after Tiananmen and all that. Um, it looked uh, dynamic, attractive, open, uh, plural, uh, exciting. And, um, you know, um, the women said, you know, the periphery is the center of it. One had that sense that this is where the real action is about chinese -ness. Um So we thought this was timely, not only that, that because of the, 
but that we all owed to Jennifer Cushman and before her um, to Wang Gangwu, uh, and as making this a kind of center of uh, Chinese diaspora studies, but because it seemed timely and, and the kind of thing that would um, attract funding and attract interest and, and be very necessary at the time. Um, so uh, I went to my, one of my few UNESCO conferences, the Society for the Study of the Chinese Overseas, and met in that for the first time there in, in I think 1998, if I'm not mistaken. Then she helped us launch the center at a wonderful event in February 99, which I hope you'll remember. I, I might have been your first visit as a guest of ANU, or, or I mean, I'm sure not the last, but you had many since. But it, it was an exciting moment when um, we thought the, the ball was really at our feet. Um, we managed to get together, I remember, for the key events, the Minister of Immigration at the time, Philip Ruddy, a controversial figure, but an important one in terms of migration policy. Um, the leader of Chinese communism uh, 50 years before that, but Xi Jinping, and somebody of the same age, I mean, the indispensable Wang Gangwu, of course, I don't think uh, Gangwu and, and uh, Xi Jinping had met, not knowingly, um, any time in that previous 50 years, but they had a lot to talk about, because they're about the same age, and, Similar sorts of beginnings to their, their lives in Pera. Um, so uh, that was a great moment, and it looked as if everything was, you know, sailing in the right direction. But uh, with the worst possible timing, I left. I, I went to um, had a couple of offers I couldn't refuse. First UCLA and then Singapore, and um, but that wasn't the only disaster. Um, of course, the tide shifted the ways which we're going to do. And um, leaving the, the Chinese diaspora in a particular dilemma, I think, in particular, more, more difficult times than, than many that we've had. There's, I've seen plenty of difficult times, but this is certainly another one. So, um, Inan is, of course, um, the ideal representative of. Of diaspora as um, the diaspora of our times, when, like probably almost all the people in, in this audience, she has had multiple movements, multiple cultural adjustments to make and negotiations to pursue and borders to cross. Uh, first from her ancestry from, from China and then from um, born in Indonesia, then growing up and being educated in Holland and finally settling in this uh, interesting uh, country, uh, Australia, and being part of the debates here over the last 20 years, 20-something uh, years. Um, she has written, as you know, many uh, seminal books, um, but the I think the one that gives me, or first gave me great comfort was, uh, I'm not speaking Chinese, but, one I mean, personally, I think I have some some inbuilt resistance to, despite being in many situations where it was absolutely desirable and necessary and easy, uh, but somehow Chinese never never penetrated. But more so, for all those who have my book Chinese or names this book Chinese, that they suffer. Uh, I mean, including my book. Well, this is one of the opportunity they bring all these evidence. So it's a great pleasure to see the um, Chinese temple, Chinese Southern diaspora living again through this conference and uh, to welcome in um, back again to the NU to uh, give this keynote lecture. Thank you very much. So, in a time of a newly assertive China, and corresponding rising Sinophobia, Chineseness has become an increasingly polarizing identity marker, both locally and globally. And in this presentation, I will argue that this polarization is exacerbated by a racialized understanding of Chineseness, that is, of Chinese people as a race, which absolutizes the divide between Chinese and non-Chinese identities. And I would argue that we need to jettison racial thinking to overcome 
this hazardous dichotomy and to make space for more heterogeneous, hybrid and unsettling diasporic identities. Now, critical perspectives on race and racism routinely argue that race is a biological fiction because there are no scientific grounds to divide humankind into different races, there can only be one indivisible human race. Yet it is clear that around the world, racial thinking is both socially pervasive and ideologically powerful. China's rising global power is giving rise to a heightened xenophobia around the world that has exacerbated anti-Chinese racism, which conjures uh, the concerning specter of a race war between Chinese and non-Chinese. In this talk, I will discuss how a racialized understanding of Chineseness, that is of Chinese people as a race, has a long and complex history, both inside and outside China, including Southeast Asia and the West. I argue that this has troubling implications for globally dispersed diasporic Chinese whose identities are irrevocably hybrid, plural, and locally inflected, but nevertheless remain chained to the boundedness imposed by a racialized Chineseness. To begin with, then, uh, I need to. Uh, uh, define what I mean by racialization. So now follow this definition by Hochmann. The process through which a group is understood to be a major biological entity and human lineage formed due to, to the reproductive isolation in which membership is transmitted through biological descent. Now, it's important to uh, understand that this process is a social and discursive process and therefore that race is not a natural thing but a socially constructed thing. But nevertheless, once it's socially constructed as a, as a concept, as an idea, it uh, works as, as if it were a natural uh, entity. And unlike ethnicity, which is culturally acquired and historically changeable, race is thought to be a fixed identity over which individuals have no control. Importantly, racialization is not just a process of othering, but also involves self-racialization. And moreover, racialized groups can be both perpetrators and victims of racism, as I will discuss in relation to the racialized group we call the Chinese. So to be, uh, what I will focus on here is uh, first to uh, race, on, race and racialization in modernizing East Asia, and more especially in China, and then to Southeast Asia. The idea of the people of the Far East as East Asia was seen from the point of view of Europe as belonging to a race, and that was called at that time the Mongolian or the yellow race, was invented by European scientists in the 18th century. And by the 19th century, Western racial paradigms were imported into Chinese and Japanese contexts. Racial thinking began to circulate widely in China from the late 19th century onwards. As yellow was an ancient and significant color in Chinese culture, the West's notion of the Chinese as the yellow race, as Givak observes in his book, Becoming Yellow, could be proudly inverted as a term of self-identification rather than just a racial slur. So in the early 20th century, nationalist reformers actively mobilized the idea of the yellow race in their efforts to integrate 
a highly fragmented country. And I'm uh, referring here to the work of the classic work of uh, Frank Picotter, The Discourse of Race in Modern China, where he observed that race was seen by many nationalists in China as the only concept capable of including both peasant and emperor. In other words, the discourse of race was deployed as an instrument of national integration. Traditional popular notions of patrilineal descent and lineage were re reconfigured by the modernizers in China into a racialized conception of China's inhabitants as the descendants of the Yellow Emperor. This Chinese nationalist racial, racial discourse could take root, according to Descartes, because it resonated with common folk models of lineage and kinship. So Descartes insists that as a global discourse, racism or racialis racialism, the idea that uh, the human uh, that humanity is divided into different races was not simply a Western invention imposed on non-Western cultures, but developed through interaction with people's local beliefs of who they are. This racialized understanding of Chinese identity became widespread after the fall of the Qing Empire and the foundation of the Chinese Republic in 1911. It was disseminated widely throughout society, for example, through school textbooks, in which, in line with the dominant pre preoccupation of Western racial science, the categorization of humankind into a hierarchy of superior and inferior uh, races was espoused, and where the view was advanced that the yellow race was the only one that could compete with the white race. By the end of the Republican period, many people in China had come to identify themselves and others in terms of race and saw the world through the lens of fundamental racialized boundaries between themselves and others. A racialized sense of belonging then was an important foundation of modern Chinese national identity in the 20th century. Importantly, this self-racialized sense of Chineseness has continued into contemporary Chinese nationalism, where the identification of the Chinese national self with the yellow race has been a fundamental element in the governmental logic of the People's Republic of China, assisting the Chinese party state in reinforcing national cohesion and patriotism. And although after 1949, Mao's China officially condemned racism, Ying Hongcheng in his book, um, I think The Discourse of Race in Rising China, stresses that this critique was a political condemnation of Western colonialism and imperialism, not a critical self-reflection of Chinese society. And, and of Chinese nationalism. Instead, the Sinocentric worldview of China's own imperial past, which posited the superiority of Han Chinese civilization in the face of barbarian foreign devils, has provided the epistemological foundation of a racial chauvinism, which has persisted in modern China. Now we'll come back to this a bit later towards the end of my talk. But first, let's go to Southeast Asia. It is interesting to consider the timing of the Chinese nationalist awakening in the late Qing and Republican era, as this was a pivotal period in the history of Southeast Asian societies. These societies were in the early into middle of the 20th century, 20th century governed by European colonial powers, but they were also spaces where, as we all know, large contingents of the Chinese diaspora has established themselves. And of course, this is very much the kind of uh, work that you all are focusing on here. We could ask ourselves 
to what extent not only European notions of racial superiority, but also Chinese senses of racial distinctiveness as imparted around that time by the Chinese nationalists in China, as I've just described, had an influence in shaping social relationships in these highly diverse colonial societies. In any case, the Chinese Revolution of 1911 emboldened Chinese pride, leading many diasporic Chinese settlers in Southeast Asia to rally for the Chinese nationalist cause. In this regard, these migrants from China were early agents of what Benedict Anderson has, has called long distance nationalism. And by doing that, they were affirming their identity as Chinese. And this Chinese identity was both ethnically and racially distinct from local native populations. Cross regional people flows associated with colonization and modernization were a crucial element in the histories of Southeast Asian social formations, turning them into what are now called multiracial societies, where the racialized compartmentalization uh, was, uh, was an intrinsic instrument of colonial governments. As, uh, this is well known that uh, this compartmentalization separated Europeans, Chinese, and other migrants and natives. And as we all know, in contemporary Southeast Asian countries, such as Malaysia and Singapore, the discursive separation of different races has been ta a taken for granted organizing principle, both socially and politically, in the process of nation building since independence. In other words, these post-colonial states adopted the colonial era power structures, including the racialized model of society, specifically by institutionalizing the categories of Chinese, Malay, Indian, and other as the prim primary markers of identity, coming together as distinct racialized communities within a multiracial nation state. Got to show this that this is for the Han nationalism. The category Malay, signifying the native in these Southeast Asian settings, was itself the object of intense racialization in colonial discourse, designating them as a brown race. It figured as the distinguishing characteristic of what came to be called the Malay archipelago, construed as a region where, in the words of British naturalist Russell Wallace, this peculiar race of mankind could be uniquely found. Importantly, the racialized construct of the Malay as the region's native race was later embraced in anti-colonial nationalist discourses, especially in post-colonial Malaysia, where the notion of the Bumiputra, son of the soil, became the legitimizing mechanism for the special position conferred of the Malay on the Malays in the constitution of the newly independent nation. The relationship between Chinese and Malays then in Southeast Asia is structurally undergirded by a racialized understanding of both groups, with the Chinese categorically allotted the status of non-indigenous race. Such racialized differentiation of Chinese and Malay identities with the express implication that the Chinese are not natives has had a persistent troubling impact on social relations within post-colonial Southeast Asia, Southeast Asian nation states. In Indonesia, for example, Chinese communities too were persistently considered other within the Indonesian social landscape, aliens who did not really belong to the country due to their non-native status. And thus, they could always be told, go back to your own country. Now, this golden command, go back to your own country, reflects an ideological stance 
sanctioned by a fundamental mode of distancing of self and other that articulates a close intersection of racism and nationalism. Much of what we call racism today then is undergirded by the universal adoption of one of the central organizing structures in the modern world, the nation state. National identification is the dominant discursive conduit for separating out our people, our community of co-nationals from others who are outsiders and foreigners. However, it is also this nationalist cultural logic that gives exclusionary meaning to the phrase, go back to where you come from. A phrase associated with anti-immigrant exclusion that is often based on racial othering. This is a racism in which the other is not simply defined biologically, for example, in terms of skin color, but also spatially. There is a strong connotation of entitlement, entitlement in the phrase, go back to where you come from. A claim to have the right to decide who does and does not belong, and who does and does not have the right to be here in the same space as us. It articulates what Ghassan Hash, the anthropologist, has called a governmental mode of national belonging which assumes a taken for granted capacity and right to speak on behalf of the nation and to control the space of the nation by ordering undesirables out. The articulation of nation and space or territory is significant here. It emphasizes the spatial boundedness of the nation and that this form of racism is a territorialized form of exclusionary othering. It also illuminates how this mode of discrimination empowers the native, those who claim, who's, who claim the status of indigeneity in the national space, and relegates the migrant, those who come from elsewhere, to the status of out-of-place stranger, whose presence, whether tolerated or not, is somehow inappropriate, not part of the natural way of things in the nation. And of course, I should say here that in the Australian context, the native or the indigenous is uh, kind of, uh, has been part of the structural settler colonial uh, organization of this country, which makes the story slightly different, but we can come back to that perhaps in the discussion. In other words, Many contemporary expressions of racism are not just associated with an inherent nationalism, but also with an entrenched nativism. The point here is not to suggest that either nationalism or nativism are by definition racist. Rather, it is to stress that they are both intrinsically linked to the institutional conception of the nation state, and as such, tend to naturalize racialized understandings of the collective national self, uh, the people who rightly belong to the nation. Nationalism and nativism have played crucial legitimizing roles in anti-colonial libera liberation movements, including those in Southeast Asia, in the process cementing the idea that the native race are the rightful owners of the nation. It is for this reason that in contemporary Malaysia and Indonesia, for example, people of Chinese descent continue to be trapped in ambivalence, as I've called in uh, one of my essays, being considered not quite Malaysian or Indonesian, despite many decades of enforced assimilation policies, uh, in the case of Indonesia, for example, due to their unerasable racialized otherness. The case of Chinese descent populations in Southeast Asia leads us to consider the peculiar relationship of race and nation in these post-colonial nation states. As discussed earlier, in East Asian countries, such as Japan and China, 
the transition to modern statehood, nation statehood, was accompanied by strongly racialized conceptions of their people, appealing powerfully to a shared sense of belonging based on presumed immutable links of blood. Here, an equivalence was effectively posited not just between nation and space, but also between nation and race. Early 20th century modernizers in China associated the notion of the Chinese nation with both racial kinship, uh, the bond that, that uh, ties the Chinese to, to each other, and to the land. And the idea that the majority of inhabitants of China belong to the Han race, Han race, uh, the indigenous race of the Middle King Kingdom, designated that way, is still taken for granted by most Chinese today. The situation, however, is quite different in Southeast Asia. Post-colonial nation states such as Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore had to establish coherent nations out of multiple races within their territories, including significant populations whose presence was due to a long history of migration, in particular, of course, the diasporic Chinese. Singapore is a particularly uh, compelling case in this regard. Singapore's post-colonial history of national, nation building is well known. From the beginning, it was conceived as a multiracial state consisting of the four distinct racial categories, uh, the Chinese, Malay, Indian, and other. The Singaporean government has persistently insisted on the maintenance of these racialized distinctions to secure an ordered and harmonious society, and in that way, normalizing the discourse of race in this city-state. Singaporeans of Chinese descent have never been able or allowed to forget their Chineseness. Instead, the government sought to reinforce their racialized identity through cultural policies such as the Speak Mandarin campaign, a government strategy to strengthen Chinese Singaporean sense that they are part of the Chinese race whose ancestral homeland is China. What makes Singapore particularly interesting is that from its birth as an independent nation state in 1965, people of Chinese descent have made up a significant majority, as we know, consistently around 75% of the population. And this is in contrast with Malaysia, with a minority Chinese population of around 25%, and Indonesia, where the Chinese minority is estimated to be around 5%. Unlike the latter two countries then, which are indigenous majority nation states, Singapore is intrinsically a settler society where the dominant majority, the racialized Chinese, are migrants or descendants of migrants. As Chinese Singaporeans are a non-indigenous majority, they cannot make a nativist claim to the territory of Singapore. Their racial identity, Chinese, does not overlap with their national identity, Singaporean, epitomizing a fundamental tension between race and nation in the context of this nation state. Here we have, uh, of course, Indonesia, uh, the Indonesian flag and, and uh, uh, the, the, the ex one of the cultural expressions of Chinese Indonesian women wearing the uh, sarang kabaya. And this is uh, Singapore. So there is this tension then in Singapore uh, between race, Chinese, and nation, Singaporean, in the context of the nation, national imaginary in Singapore. And this tension came dramatically to a head recently when Singapore saw the influx of many new migrants from mainland China. And I'm uh, following here work by a young uh, researcher, Sylvia Ang, uh, 
who uh, has found uh, that uh, she did research uh, in Singapore where she found that mainland Chinese migrants often berate Chinese Singaporeans for not speaking Mandarin fluently, despite the government's decade-long speak Mandarin campaign, implying that they are more Chinese than their Chinese Singaporean uh, counterparts. As Ang remarks, Mandarin has become the heart of the battle between mainland Chinese migrants and Chinese Singaporeans. She further notes that Chinese Singaporeans tend to defend their poor Mandarin skills by asserting that they are a different, better kind of Chinese than mainlanders, who may speak only Mandarin and have poor English. Now, what we could derive from such discursive skirmishes is not just a contestation of what constitutes Chineseness, but I would suggest more fundamentally, the very fracturing of the Chinese as a race, right? I think I should put this one. Uh, it, unra it unravels the fictive construct of the Han race as a singular people, highlighting instead that Chineseness is deployed as a flexible signifier claimed and contested as an identity by different people in different ways. Ang argues that Chinese Singaporeans are in a weak position vis-a-vis -vis mainland Chinese migrants in their defense of their Chineseness, as they are less steeped in what is considered officially as authentic, true Chinese culture. But they would be in a much stronger position when mobilizing their national identity, their Singaporeanness, in their symbolic disputes with mainland Chinese migrants. And here then, Chinese Singaporeans could resort to what can be called a tactic of self-indigenization, claiming their spatial belonging to Singapore as their nation, thereby disavowing their history of migration and declaring themselves to be territorially and nationally at home. And in this context, declaring oneself to be a local is to claim the superior right of governmental belonging to it, to use Kassan Hash's term. In Singapore, this happened some years ago, to give you just as an ex a popular culture example, in the wake of the so-called curry wars. When a newly arrived mainland Chinese family sought to prohibit their Indian Singaporean neighbors to cook curry because they could not tolerate the smell. Mediation led to the settlement that the Indian family would only cook curry when the Chinese neighbors were not at home, while the Chinese family acceded to try, try out a curry dish. And this was an official mediation uh, Government, governmentally organized. But this incident quickly led to huge protest from Singaporeans of all stripes who defended curry as a valuable part of Singapore's national multiracialism. A cook and share a pot of curry campaign gained widespread support with 60,000 residents reportedly participating in the event. And what you can see here then is the, ex the exercise of a mode of governmental belonging by Singaporeans, including many Chinese Singaporeans who articulated their cultural ownership of the nation, not as Chinese, but as Singaporeans, not as racialized subjects, but as na national citizens. Their symbolic activism was targeted against the mainland Chinese migrants, not because they were Chinese, but because they were outsiders to the nation. Now, the cultural nationalism expressed here is not based on collective racial identification, nor on claims of indigeneity or nativity, 
But on the production of a localized syncretic nationhood validated by the experience of a diversity of races living together within one nation, which could be described as a singular accomplishment really of a hybridizing multiracial nation. On behalf of this transracial national culture, modes of discrimination are fanned against undesirable migrant others, migrant others, mainland Chinese or otherwise, who are relegated to the realm outside the nation's boundaries. When the foreign other becomes one's neighbor, however, as was the case with the mainland Chinese family living next to the Indian Singaporean family, Chinese Singaporeans emphatically took the side of their Indian co-nationals against their mainland Chinese foes, in spite of their racial sameness. And as Chua Ben Huat notes, it is common for local Chinese Singaporeans to refer to mainland Chinese citizens working in Singapore as foreign workers, right? Not as fellow Chinese. Now what this suggests then is that the prefix Chinese is no longer capable of guaranteeing pan-racial identification among Chinese Singaporeans. Their solidarity is not with the co-racial other, that is the mainland Chinese, but with their multiracial co-nationals. Here, nation trumps race, and we witness an interesting fracturing of the very idea of a unitary Chinese race. So consider that circle, the Chinese race, and it's, there is a fracture there. Now, this, is, this does not mean, however, that issues of race and race relations are no longer salient in a place like Singapore. On the contrary, the very construction of Singapore as a multiracial nation postulated on the institutionalization of the CMIO mosaic that proclaims the formal equality of the distinct racialized groups underwritten by the idea of racial harmony, diffuses the social reality that ethnic Chinese not only hold a significant numerical majority in Singapore, but also occupy most positions of power and influence in the country. The official national image of a harmonious multiracial society tends to obscure the existence of internal modes of racism. As uh, Selfraj Velayutam has observed, daily life in Singapore is littered with mundane and not so mundane instances of racial stereotyping and discrimination. For example, through name calling, racist jokes, and differential treatment, including in the workplace. His research found that Indian and Malay Singaporeans are acutely aware of the advantages enjoyed by their Chinese co-nationals, but tended to feel powerless to resist such unfair treatment. He found that there is such a low level of consciousness of racial discrimination amongst the Chinese that they are generally unaware of their cultural dominance. He notes that there is a normalization of Chinese privilege in Singapore. An ethno-racial hierarchy permeates society based on the assumption of the superiority of the Chinese. Now, you could compare this Chinese privilege in Singapore with white privilege in Western societies where white people also tend to be unaware of their racial hegemony. If this is so, how then to understand the broader, broader politics of racialized Chineseness? This question gains its poignancy when we consider the Singapore case in the wider regional Asian context and in global geopolitics more generally. For although the Chinese are positioned as the dominant race within the boundaries of the Singaporean nation state, Outside this limited and bounded context, the status of the Chinese as a people 
is much more contested. It has been argued that the official declaration of Singapore as a multiracial state at independence, despite the large numerical dominance of the ethnic Chinese population, was a strategic move to avoid the perception of Singapore as a Chinese nation in the Malay world of archipelagic like Southeast Asia. Singaporean Prime Minister uh, Li Shen Lung recently articulated the precarity of this geopolitical reality, remarking that, and I quote, Singapore has made enormous efforts to build a multiracial national identity and not a Chinese one, and that it has to be extremely careful to avoid doing anything that could be misperceived as allowing itself to be used as a cat's paw by China. Li also stressed the constraints of China's role in Southeast Asia due to the delicate place of the Chinese minorities in Southeast Asian countries, saying, these countries are extremely sensitive about our any perception that China has an inordinate influence on their ch ethnic Chinese populations. And indeed, racialized sensitivities are barely below the surface in neighboring states such as Malaysia and Indonesia, where, as discussed, the pol politics of Malay indigeneity contrasted with the non-indigenous status of the Chinese has been central to post-colonial nation building. And interracial tension has have erupted when COVID-19 infections spread quickly around the world in 2020. China, where the pandemic started in Wuhan, was widely held accountable for the plight, spawning an outbreak of anti-Chinese hostility throughout Southeast Asia. Throughout the region, including in Singapore, grassroots demands to ban people from China garnered thousands of signatures in the early days of the pandemic, and there were widespread reports about mainland Chinese citizens being shunned from schools, hotels, restaurants, and public transport. Moreover, intensified animosity towards China, and by extension, the Chinese, is now a worldwide trend. Xenophobia is, of course, not a new a phenomenon exemplified by the persistence of the yellow peril trope that has signaled Western anti-Chinese attitudes since the 19th century, but still has, has a very strongly contemporary uh, resonances. What is new today, however, is that this anti-Chinese viewpoint is driven by heightened anxiety about the impact of China's rising global power. Misgivings about China's inexorable, inexorable ascent to superpower status have thus de deepened anti-Chinese racism, targeting not just the PRC government, but Chinese-identified people through generalized forms of racial profiling. In such anti-Chinese attitudes, Chineseness is submitted to a racialized reductionism, erasing all cultural, historical, political, or national distinctions. It doesn't matter whether you are a Chinese Australian, Chinese American, Chinese Singaporean, or from Hong Kong or Taiwan, you are all Chinese. In such a reductive context, Chinese Singaporeans too would be racialized as Chinese thereby upholding their membership of the Chinese race, despite the, their dissociation from the mainland Chinese and their hybridization in the multiracial national context of Singapore. Rather than a fracturing of the Chinese as a race, what we have here is a subsumption of all hyphenated Chinese, no matter how hybridized and plural, into a single, singular umbrella race, the Chinese race. And this is a way of visualizing it 
So the circle is still there. This actually circle remains uh, intact, in, in, even though it is internally fractured. When Chineseness is racialized in this way, it becomes a hazardous signifier, which threatens a vicious, essentialized bifurcation of the world, polarizing Chinese and non-Chinese people into mutually exclusive blocks with no space for heterogeneous, hybrid, and plural diasporic identities. What makes matters worse is that intensifying global anti-Chinese posturing like this may in turn reinforce the fervent racialization of Chinese self-identity occurring in China itself, which, as I have already said, identifies the nation with the yellow race. So in his recent book, Discourses of Race in Rising China, Ying Hong Cheng describes how a racialized construct of Chinese nationalism is a significant cohesive force deploying, deployed by the people, People's Republic of China's leadership to drive people towards the idea of the so-called China dream. Zhang argues that this belief in the distinct identity of the Chinese as the yellow race also makes Chinese nationalism more passionate, making the massive state efforts to co-opt the global, dis globally dispersed diasporic Chinese more compelling by insisting on their everlasting racialized ties to the ancestral homeland. Even though many people of Chinese descent around the world have long become citizens of other countries and have embraced very different identifications. As Van Dongen and Liu observe, for the first time in history, a rising China defines the dynamic relationship with its diaspora. Animated by the construct of an imagined global Chinese community, bounded by the presumed essential sameness of all Chinese as a race. The danger of this rallying of the unified or unitary Chinese race is clear, as Cheng warns. He says, given the history of anti-Chinese racial politics from North America to Southeast Asia, the Chinese party state's strategy for global black-based Chineseness will perfectly facilitate such anti-Chinese racism. Racial nationalism then preys not only on others, but eventually victimizes the members of its own blood community. In short, the interlocking of a racialized Chinese view of themselves on the one hand, with the racialization of people of Chinese descent in the West as well as Southeast Asia, and elsewhere, on the other, starkly presages the exclusionary image of a proverbial race war, in which there is little room for those lumped together into a homogenized yellow race to articulate their complex and hybrid identity, including the many people who still somehow identify themselves and as are identified by others as Chinese, but have very different diasporic histories and positionalities. So how do we get out of this situation? One way is of course to jettison the very idea of the Chinese as a race. But this is a difficult task as it requires an interrogation of racial thinking as such in a world where the idea of humanity's division into essentially distinct races remains hardwired as a fundamental organizing principle in culture and society. In the Chinese case, it is particularly difficult due to the enormous importance given to descent and lineage in Chinese culture. Asserting the existence of a variety of Chinese ethnicities rather than, rather than a single Chinese race, and this is what many people try to do, is also limited, in my view, as long as the label Chinese itself 
refers back inevitably to an originary ancestral homeland to which diasporic identities remain chained no matter how far removed they have traveled through time and space. Moreover, although Chinese ethnic identities in various parts of the world are culturally dynamic and historically evolving, they can never entirely escape being racialized, often by virtue of what they look like. Race and ethnicity can therefore not be easily disentangled. The only way diasporic identities can unsettle the imposed absolutism of race and nation is through the unsettling process of hybridity, as hybridity as is the antithesis of fixed, singular, and bounded identity and of essentialized, racialized Chineseness. It is because of the multifarious trajectories of cultural hybridization in many local contexts that top-down attempts to foist a unitary racial identity on all those identified as Chinese are never going to succeed. But hybridity can only chip away at the fundamentalist idea of Chinese, the Chinese as a race. It cannot displace it. And this is, I'm afraid, the paradox we have to live and work with. Thank you so much for the, this presentation. Um, and I was interested in the various ways in which the factors of identity are understood, policed, and you know, perceived, and how this can be very contingent depending on the political context and the pluralism within the nation state. But with, especially in this past year, there has been so much anti-Asian violence in which, like, for example, some, um, it was a Burmese American family that were attacked because of COVID. And to, to what extent, you know, is there a movement within uh, Chinese-ness to actively embrace Asian-ness or to, to dissociate? I mean, I'm, I'm curious to see how this has provoked new kinds of fractures and antagonisms. I, I think, what, I mean, this is one of the things I've been uh, thinking about quite a lot about how in Western countries, uh, anti-Chinese and anti-Asian racism slides in from each other. And mostly this is because other Asians are mistaken for the Chinese. Right, right. And uh, of course, this creates its own conflicts and antagonisms. Uh, at the same time, it can also create solidarity, depending on the groups involved. Uh, this has happened in, in, in the US, uh, Australia as well, uh, for, for many, many years. So, but, but I do think uh, that it's important even in Australia, for example, that uh, this, we, we, we shouldn't just accept this slide from Chinese to Asian without critiquing it because I think even in Australia, of course, uh, when you look at who are the Asians in Australia, they're all racialized together. Asian is that the race, it's not Chinese, right? Um, uh, the Chinese is still very much in the majority. What you do uh, get uh, in Australian context, I think, is that uh, people, uh, maybe Burmese or uh, Vietnamese or people uh, who might be mistaken for Chinese actually feel that they have difficulty expressing their own identities given the majority voice of the Chinese. So, yeah, so uh, Yes, I think it's, it's complicated because uh, it's always these different uh, lumping different groups together in different contexts. Yes, I don't think I need that microphone. Uh, There's a question. Uh, 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 Charlie uh, Carlton, as we call him, of course. And <coughs> my question is that uh, you don't emphasize the culture of Chinese people. 
you know, whether it is in China or in diaspora throughout the years. We have 5,000 years of Confucius speech, respect of parents, absolutely emphasize on education, treat people, and not in a way. That is part and parcel of being Chinese. On the question of this discrimination, prejudice against Chinese, people see that over the last five, ten years is actually a crusade by many Anglo Saxon countries. You've got to distinct from Europe, France, Germany, all the other countries, except Anglo Saxon. These are actually the perception in Washington, D.C., or the deep state in the U.S., is that China is just English domination in the federal And that's the reason why the discrimination is protected. Has been extensively over the last three years. And second, the prejudice and the discrimination of China always been there in these countries. I remember before 1949, the Chinese people <coughs> were regarded as inferior, unclean, sly, you know, all these poor, miserable, poor Chinese who saw this country and contaminate our pure, clean Anglo Saxon neighbors. That is what it is. If you don't believe, go to the National Library and look at the Moon Bulletin magazine. And this is because of Anglo Saxon spirit. So, this particular, I hope the new administration in Washington, D.C., will come to realize that by going this way, it's going to be war. And when it's a war, it will not be It will be nuclear. And it will lead to the destruction of the Red. And of course, China as well. And so the question is that this country has a like, comment comes to the end. Is there a question or a comment? <laughs> well, um, the thing is that uh, we were talking about the Chinese, but also the, the fact that uh, Chinese migrants have gone so through, through many to many different parts of the world and become, become uh, uh, citizens of different countries. And as a result, uh, what is Chinese identity has become much more uh, plural and also predetermined uh, by a lot of uh, influences in the multiple locations that they're in. And, uh, also, as a generation, uh, when we talk about Chinese Americans, let's say in the uh, five uh, generations, as kind of like who they are is actually quite different from those uh, who uh, have remained in mainland China. So I think we need to think about uh, Chinese culture in a much more dynamic uh, and uh, historically global way. Um, but on the other hand, I think I find that what the uh, governments in uh, Washington, D.C., as well as here in Canberra, are thinking about China, the hostility towards China today, to which extent it has something to do with their suspicions about the Chinese as a race, I think that is an interesting uh, question. And I think, well, you know, of course, uh, any kind of racial uh, judgment of our prejudice will not be expressed explicitly, but uh, it will be there. I think uh, in, in, in this, uh, this, this trust and, and, and um, sense of, of suspicion. So, yeah, I mean, that's uh, one question. Then, but seems to me more. Um, for Amber's in terms of actually looking at that aspect is how the Chinese aspect gets to this um, one, or the, the rise of China and the acceptance of China. Um, I mean, is it, is it having an effect of making Chinese more relevant than the Chinese and more interest to their identity? Is that a Chinese race? Yeah, the racialization. Or of learning to cover and uh, something else. I mean, mm -hmm. it, 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 this is 
and the flow of things that are actually under here. And it was another of those points. So it's like, like around the early 1900s, and Chinese national society. And we thought about it. What's happening now? Yeah. I remember. I mean, I think that's an interesting question. I think it's really something that needs to be researched on. Uh, from my, the, the conjecture and empirical research that I, I have seen, again, of course, not all Chinese are the same. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, that's why I do think that this notion of uh, the Chinese government's idea of the global Chinese community as a unified. Like uh, <laughs> a single racial identity, uh, my optimism says that that will never succeed. <laughs> but but uh, at the same time, uh, there is also because of the uh, uh, again the hostility from the West and, and perhaps some association governments uh, that will also uh, that will bring about people of Chinese backgrounds together in their chinese So, you know, so that too is a very dynamic uh, standard. Um, uh, well, we assemble that thoughts, but I, can I try you on something else? I was struck with that your point that uh, do Generally, and terrible generalization. If you did make this generalization about Chinese culture, it does work an awful lot of it. a lineage, mm -hmm. uh, seemingly making Chinese reluctant to <clears throat> say, well, forget Chinese. Fuck Chinese. No, but you could. And uh, as I mean, uh, you know, um, Stepanovsky or something who comes here and that happily adopts the name Stevens because he is tired of being the only body, basically, the way. Why bother? Why persist? Um, I mean, one would think that that's always a choice for migrants. And even for Chinese migrants, one sees how in Thailand and in the Philippines, Chinese have been willing to jettison their name, at least in public purposes, in order to just be dialed. And it seems to work. But can you think why that doesn't work elsewhere? I think I know very few Chinese in Australia that take that step. I mean, through marriage, something to that quite happen, but not that for them. Well, I, I think one of the uh, problems <coughs> is that the discourse on race, mm -hmm. the idea of race, is so much uh, dependent on uh, visuality. Or, uh, yes. You're not Chinese, I mean, I, I'm not Chinese anyway, so I have to be Chinese. I mean, I've heard this many times, you know, mm -hmm. right? and I don't think. Well, yeah, <laughs> you can't say I'm not Swedish, it's a very but uh, yeah. so there is that sense of Chinese, the yellow, the idea of the yellow race, I think, is quite ideologically potent. Uh, yeah. Even my mother, you know, uh, in Indonesia, was saying, well, we must be on the sense of the yellow race. I think that was kind of a popular identity that is quite entrenched, and I think that this is something very much part of, of you know, the legacy of Chinese. So, yeah. what says? Um, two questions. The first one is uh, given the situation just right now, like anti Asian or anti Chinese, it's really um, in these days. Do you think the knowledge of uh, Chinese diaspora 
in any ways can contribute to to actually uh, reacting to this this movement. Do you think that as academics, what we can do to actually contribute to to guide or whatever do something about this uh, social moment? That's the first question. And the second question is actually I've been reading another book. Uh, their growth is a uh, vegan nation, they say. It's, it's actually a totally different kind of diaspora studies, but it's kind of in the same kind of situation, right? And uh, so his effort was actually to uh, try to discover more local archives and records to show different layers or the complexities of, of what's real, what really diaspora name for the local people in their strategies of living. So do, do uh, can you think of any similar research in terms of Southeast Asian diaspora studies that actually use the local uh, you know like records or to to impact the complexity of this? Thank you so much. Uh, uh, um, so I ended uh, my talk with, with a very brief discussion of uh, hybridity. And uh, hybridity, I think, I mean, uh, whenever I think about it, it's still the only thing I can come up with. And it's a way of by looting these inquisitions of unitary and unification. Uh, and definitely there is there's a lot of work, let's say, in Indonesia, uh, where I think in Indonesia the, the situation for Chinese Indonesians has always been very precarious and the main uh, you know, This is my own family like that, so I don't know what that is. Um, and uh, I think that, that no matter how much you in Indonesianize yourself, there is always also uh, the counter effect of being racialized as Chinese, and you always have to fight against that. Uh, and it's that that's why I don't think that this can ever be resolved until uh, everyone has recycled. <laughs> and this is exactly what's not happening precisely because of the racial I don't think it is that. Well, in some yeah. respects. But, but then a new fetish will come up and they'll not yeah. latch onto that phenotype and then that will be others. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's reproduction is the endless lottery of traits. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's very complicated. Oh, yeah, so I just wanted to first of all make a comment. So my comment is thank you. I mean, I think this discussion of the, that very interesting historical interaction between Western racial discourse and Chinese lineage, um, and particularly the fact lineage is really, really interesting. And I really appreciated the kind of diverse locations in which you were tracking the race concept in relationship to the concept of nation. Um, I wanted to challenge you a bit on hybridity <laughs> uh, because I suppose having dealt with similar kinds of questions in the Oceanic context, yes. um, I find trouble with the hybridity notion because of its ancestral origin, if you like, in questions about, you know, miscegenation, flat breeding, etc. And it is very much really sustaining that organic kind of notion on which race depends. Now, I know that language is also a very big difficulty. After all, you, you wrote that book on speaking, not speaking Chinese. Um, but I've always preferred sort of ideas of realization or something that kind of dislodges, I suppose, that sense of the essentialist organic. Um, so I don't know that the situation is the, is, is the answer. I mean, I think all those questions about intermarriage and you know, sexual relations are uh, incredibly fascinating. But, uh, what do you do with critiques of the hybrid uh, Well, there is a lot of that, uh, you know, and uh, I would completely uh, go along with that, that critique in the sense that I don't think hybridity is a perfect concept. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, 
But I think one of the concepts we have, uh, and pre organization, you know, mm -hmm. I think we could use that group, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, in, in a sense, given uh, it's, what is race? I mean, and, and the whole idea of the human race is indivisible. Obviously, so flies in the face of everyone's uh, understanding of, of the people of the world. Uh, I suppose given the pervasiveness of those <laughs> essentialism, yeah. both in the celebration of the Chinese race, the you know, people, but also the anti Chinese attacks, which of course are equally predicated on divine diversity, um, maybe it's better to use something that is, that is rather than <coughs> organic because that kind of <laughs> opposes yeah. uh, the essentialism. Of, of so that was a very, I mean, this, this book that I mentioned. Uh, in Hong Kong. I mean, he, he, I think he's doing quite interesting research, and he did uh, an article about that long ago. It's about the role of DNA testing. Mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and I can't quite remember his argument, but, but more or less it's like actually, assuming DNA testing, we can actually uh, argue for a globalization of, of the human race because of so much mix up in DNAs mm -hmm. and uh, identities anyway. So, you know, that goes right into that. You know, all the kind of research around ancient DNA, I was thinking a few years ago, talking about this in the Syrian context, and it's, <laughs> it's both, you know, very troubling, and the ethics of science is very troubling, uh, but it also does explode a lot of of um, kind of racial, yeah. racial essentials. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So they have two questions online. Oh, Do you want to take the online? The oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, now I've forgotten what the question was. Oh, yeah. Um, so what about the knowledge of the dinosaurs? There are two, I think, is. Um, in some ways, uh, diasporic uh, subjects will, will have to be more, uh, more clever, really, than uh, the locals. <laughs> or the native, or, you know, the, the, the nationals. In the sense that I think you will have to show that you are uh, uh, actually you, you have more in your cultural um, uh, baggage than just one identity. So having multiple identities as such and being able to express them very well. Is, is an important thing. So, for example, if uh, the, the Chinese, like, like for example, those people who were uh, accused by the friends of being Chinese communist, uh, you know, was it? Uh, he, they were asked whether they to condemn the Chinese yeah. communist party. Yeah. 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 yeah, anyway, so if, uh, uh, the way they could uh, articulate very strongly and very well their Australianness is the way to kind of uh, counter that kind of attack. But it does put a lot of onus on, on, on you. I mean, that, that's how it is, I think. You know, the diasporic people are never going to be the ones in power. So that's just how it is, I think. And then we go online. Yeah, so we have two questions. Um, so um, the first one is, wonder how much mainland Chinese or the Chinese government would regard overseas Chinese as Chinese. Um, this is from Ching Yang. He feels, or he or she feels that um, to some extent it seems to have a border for this one. The mainland Chinese um, government's recognition of overseas Chinese as Chinese. So the second one is um, from uh, Kuk Hun Pui. 
Um, so um, the person asks, with the number of interracial couples are on the rise around the world, including in Southeast Asia, more individuals who identify with Chinese parentage and culture don't always appear to be racially Chinese. Wouldn't this somehow significantly debunk the homogeneity of the racialized Chinese-ness notion? <laughs> yes, I mean, to say that the yes, the, the second question, I mean, that comes back to the, the uh, comment that Margaret was making uh, about uh, the, the notion of mixed race is in itself, of course, very complex. And uh, um, uh, in the US, uh, there has been struggles to make that a separate census category and, and things like that. But, uh, I think uh, definitely the notion of of the unity of the race will be problematized by that. Mm-hmm. Then we get with these issues of of that being seen as as you know kind of, um, um, threatening the purity of the race and that kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. yeah. The other question is on the mainland Chinese. You think you use the- Hmm? Oh, okay. Okay. So, yeah, so the first question on mainland Chinese governments, um, whether they regarded um, overseas Chinese as Chinese. I think it's... Well, there has been a lot of history of how Chinese government uh, deals with its diaspora. The very idea of its diaspora so describes the kind of possessive relationship towards it, which, uh, uh, from what I have read, uh, is something that, that has become more strongly uh, the policy in uh, mainland China today. So that means that there is certainly, and of course, there is a distinction between the Huaren child and the Huan uh, recent mainland Chinese migrants. A lot of diaspora policy will probably focus on the latter group, but at the same time, there's a blurring of the, of the different uh, uh, Chinese uh, migrant uh, generations by the um, declaration of a global Chinese community, which is uh, unified in a way, kind of in the imagination. But, uh, well, I mean, that's kind of very much an imagined community. Um, I wondered if another of the boundaries that was in that question, and does the PRC have some boundaries to its inclusiveness? Was in the category of patriotic terms as opposed to as yeah. opposed to what exactly? Yeah, well, I mean, of course, I, I think the Chinese government is also. I mean, there has been a long history uh, in the in the <coughs> Chinese in Southeast Asia in, in the nineteen fifties, for example, when uh, uh, there were a lot of negotiations between the Chinese government and, and the newly established you know, Southeast Asian uh, countries. Uh, about how to deal with the, the Chinese diaspora uh, sort of minorities. And uh, I think the Chinese government has always been uh, trying to be very careful not to include uh, too much of those people who have become nationals, nationals of the Southeast Asian country, Chinese people, um, who have become Indonesian, and so. Uh, so uh, that I think very much in the context of uh, a world in which the United Nations is uh, uh, really naturalizing this idea of sovereign national states. And so the different national sovereign nation states have their boundaries. And all diasporic politics, uh, cultures, peoples actually always makes the question of boundaries problematic and has to be dealt with in very uh, careful ways to ensure that uh, there are no wars happening. So I can't see the Chinese government now, for example, uh, making very explicit claims <coughs> on Chinese Australians, let's say, who have been born here and things like that. But at the same time, uh, the idea of having Chinese ancestry is an appeal 
that continues to be worked on. I mean, we have all these uh, programs of bringing uh, uh, people of Chinese descent back to their own villages and things like that, which also uh, very much articulates this notion of, of lineage descent that's essential for Chinese identity. So, you know, there's a push and pull of, of these values. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Uh, is there more on the yeah. question? Yeah. 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 power. Yeah. 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 power. If you look at history, the fear of the stranger, the fear of the unknown, has always been very important for, for defending yourself in the other. And I think there's a fundamental emphasis on racism. You do not know the stranger, so you don't offer your hand, you offer the soul. Secondly, your understanding of the stranger is very blur in the beginning. You don't differentiate between nuances. Likewise, when you look at the Chinese, you talk about the Chinese. Who are the Chinese? In China, the Han is the majority, the only other minorities. Overseas Chinese, the Malaysian Chinese, the Poor Chinese, the Indonesian Chinese, and they don't speak the same language at the time. And yet, because of the fear of the outer, you lump them all together, and therefore you treat them as if they are one when they are not. So the question is, how do you deal with it? How do you solve the problem? It's one basically an understanding that fear is based not on reality, but on perception, one projection of what the danger is, and two, trying to understand what the different nuances are. Um, whether it be Chinese, whether it be Black, whether it be Indian, whatever it is. And the tragedy is that the fear outpaces the solution. I can deal with the fear. Um, and I, yeah, I don't have the answer to that. I think, I mean, I, 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 so, certainly in relation to the Chinese, that fear, especially, for example, when you look at the images, the racist images of the early 20th century of the Chinese, which always uh, visualizes the Chinese as this huge monster, right? Um, that is a particular way of, of uh, expressing the fear that says volumes about how the Chinese are perceived. And I think it has a lot to do with China being such a huge country. You know, and uh, the idea of the Chinese people, the Chinese race being one third of the Global population, I think, it's still such fear. But it's a fear, I think, that is disavowed often. You know, so um, these are kinds of things that are very difficult to resolve. You know, so that's why I think the only thing we can do is, is um, soften the, the uh, damaging impact of such ideologies such uh, ways of, of arguing. Uh, there, are, there is no solution, uh, except for trying to live together in particular contexts, uh, in particular situations, in ways that recognizes that we all have multiple and plural identities. And that's the only solution I see. Well, that's, that's a great way to begin the conference. Uh, but to help quite giving up and going out, we know we're not going to find a solution. <laughs>
but we have had a terrific start and we've had an issue. Please join me in thanking again. Yeah.